hi to was hi i'm back with what one year of the mortal bone i'm nearly to you at eight o'clock but so it's like the hottest day of the year it's july the 17th right now recording and it's so hot i had to wait for time where we're to get a bit cooler to do this so that's what's changed because the sun's starting to set that's why so it's a very very hot day so finally i'm doing this with you okay it's a novelization of the dark crystal now i absolutely love the dark crystal i might have loved labyrinth but close enough and I'm absolutely a massive fan of Puppeteerian and Hidden Henson Creature Shop in general. I mean, I was that, okay, the film came out in 1982. I was four years old, 1984. And my parents were like many parents of the generation. Um, oh, Judy, oh, there's this film, it's by the man of the light, he does Sesame Street. So, do you want to watch it? It's called The Dark Crystal. Okay. Yeah, okay, four years old, yes. Yes, I was absolutely terrified. I was absolutely terrified of the Dark Crystal. And by the same time though, I was terrified but I was also intrigued because obviously I was four years old, I was quite young, but I could see for myself how good puppeteering could be, the next level of puppeteering. And the fact is that even though it was a box office failure, it is such a cult hit that inspired its own book series, it's inspired um, graphic art, it's inspired in a way also um, Labyrinth, and it's inspired so much and also inspired a prequel series, The Age of Rebellion, which was on Netflix and I didn't get a series too, which was a shame because it was absolutely brilliant. There's a scene where they have puppets doing puppetry. I actually will find it and pull it down below. Just if you haven't seen it, if you don't know anything about it, it explains what happened, the Great Conjuncture, the original event, which um, tore the two species apart. And it's just beautiful. It's just amazing. So, okay. Let me read the blurb. There's not much of a blurb. That's why you need to actually know the film before you read this book. Okay? So. Another world, another time in the age of wonder. Experience the incredible magic of Jimmy Henson's fantasy epic, The Dark Crystal, directed by A.C. H. Smith, a person overseen by Jim Henson. Featuring unpublished illustrations by legendary artist Brian Feld and production design team at Jim Henson's Creature Shop, as well as Jim Henson's never seen before notes on an early draft of the adaptation containing his vision for the fantastical world of Thrall. That's interesting, okay, because Thrall is never actually mentioned as a planet in the original film. It's only through later media I actually got to mention, okay? So, this book. Now, first of all, look at Brian Frode. Now, Brian Frode basically designed all the creatures, the conceptual art, he kind of helped build the world. And also, he also did a labyrinth as well. Now, whatever you're going to say about the Dark Crystal, we must be grateful for it. Because on the set of the Dark Crystal, that Brian Frode met his wife, Wendy. And I have actually met Brian Frode. Let me just show you these, okay? It's my collection. Uh, the Fantasy, sorry, A Field Guide to Goblins, A Goblin Companion by Brian Frode and Terry Jones, okay? And, sign, see? Just step, sign, sign. And also, my DVD. The collector's edition of Brian of Labyrinth with a fantasy com commentary by Brian Frode and um, signed by him as well. He was a little bit miffed that um, in the actual scene at the end where it has what inspired the dream, okay, it has everyone like the Wizard of Oz is there and everything else, but it doesn't have anything about Brian Frode because they kind of forgot to put it in there and it definitely was a bit miffed by that. But Anyway, and also his son Toby is baby Toby in Labyrinth, and the only reason he got that gig was they auditioned many children, but they needed one who didn't freak out when they saw the puppets. And the only child who didn't was baby Toby Frode, who was about one years old at the time, because he was just used to them, because he just kind of grew up around them. He was only one years old, but he knew, he kind of knew them, okay? So, and Toby Frode himself is also a puppeteer, and he has done very, very well for himself. He has also worked on the Dark Crystal Age of Rebellion and he's also far himself so actually brought his own baby to the set after watching a documentary. So it's like a beautiful circle, isn't it? It's just wonderful that I could just even say that. It's like a beautiful circle of the Frode family in the Dark Crystal itself. So let me talk about the book. Now for those who know the plot, now I'm not an expert in the Dark Crystal mythology. If I get anything wrong, please correct me down in the comments. I'm apologising now, okay? Essentially an event happened where a species called the Us, um, Usex were attempting to harness the power of a crystal, which was like the heart and body of the world of Thrall. A fragment splintered off 
and it's split the two species into two separate races. The Skeskis, who are the embodiment of evil, if you will, the dark, the dark parts of the as, uh, um, of aspects, okay, the greed, the selfishness, the jealousy, the vanity, and the Ura, who were the kind of the thinkers, the philosophers, the good, if you will, good and bad. Now, the Skeskis, after a period of time, kind of took over, became the ruling kind of class, if you will, and began to subjugate the people of Thrall, who are the podlings. Now, in the book, they are described as pod people, okay? That's just the way it is. In the Age of Rebellion, they are podlings. Let's go with podlings. I will just call them podlings from now on because it's more natural. And whilst the Uwa kind of started to wander and kind of try to find some balance and try to, I don't know, maybe kind of keep their distance while they waited for the moment where they could get reformed with if the broken shard of the crystal was put back in at the great conjuncture where three planets align of thrall and it will essentially the crystal back in place it would reform them okay if that hopefully that made sense okay i said i'm not an expert but that's as close as i can get i do recommend the prequel series the age of rebellion please it's so beautiful carpets do i love you i do okay so it starts off with Jen. Now, obviously, I said the Unra and the Skeskis are kind of linked species. Um, the Skeskis have been harnessing the power of the crystal, they turned it dark, if you will, to keep themselves young and essentially immortal, okay? But in doing so, they've also extended the lives of the Ura, who are in hiding at this point. And at the same time, there's been an absolute genocide of well, both the podlings and also the gelflings, who are the dominant species, and there's no hour or two left. This is Jen. This is Jen. Now, Jen is now. Sorry, that's my foot. Jen is what you would call a decoy protagonist. Now, the book starts with him, but essentially, his journey. He's joined by Kira, who I think many many people would agree she is now way more dominant than he is. But anyway, let's start with Jen. Mm -hmm. This is when Jen is with his master Ura. Now, this book is quite confusing. That's why I need to know the film. People are called um, Skeskis, let's be just up, they know start with Sket a lot, okay? Sketla, Sketmat kind of thing. Whereas the Ura, everyone is Ursa, okay? Or as equivalent, all begins with Ur, so this is the way it is. So the Ursa and at the time the Emperor, okay, they're dying together, okay? So this is when Jen finds out his mission. This is a hero's quest after all, or a joint quest. Right, mm hmm. I was born under a shattered sky, he finally got out. Jen swallowed hard, forced himself to remain calm. Please, he said, it's me, Jen. Again, the ancient one waved his hand with impatience. His mouth moved, shepherd in the words. A crystal sang, he breathed, heavily in. A crystal sang to the free made one. The dark column, the rose column, and the radiance itself. Jen moved closer, leaning down to speak. His master muttered, listen, you must understand, you must. Of the 999 Thrine, plus one Thrine, mine is happy here. The Great Conjuncture, the Crystal saying, I was born, ah, Skeskis too. Right. So he's just trying to explain this is what happened, but Jen has no basis of understanding what happened. He's clueless about what happened. He doesn't know. All he knows is he's an orphan girlfriend being raised in hiding, and he doesn't really know why until now. Now, literally, his master dies, and has been sent on this quest. Okay. Now, what's interesting as well is when it comes to gender within the Skeskis, now, it's interesting as well. Now, I'm going to talk about this now because um, in the Dark Crystal, it's obviously the puppeteers are... The majority of the puppeteers did the voices too, also more men. However, when it comes to the Skeskis, they actually, I think they were, they're having the concept of gender. Now, I looked on their, they actually have a Dark Crystal um, Wikipedia, okay, trying to find out more, and they are genderless, they don't have gender. However, they assume male pronouns, they notice that, okay, they assume male pronouns, right. And uh, this bit here, right, now I'm going to talk about um, this bit here, okay, this is when um, the Emperor's died, it's like a power struggle to get the throne, he will become the new Emperor, okay, this bit here. Right. There are factions to consider among the rest of the Skeskis. Would the treasurer and the scroll keeper preserve their traditional loyalty to the ritual master? 
with the Grand Son Master still command the powerful support of the scientist and the slave master, and what would the Chamberlain still be joined in a triple alliance with the Grumman and the Ornamentalist? They tried that together, would the old Emperor have formed the largest and definitely successful faction against the previous enthronement? Right, okay. So the Ornamentalists I want to talk about, okay? So when it comes to the gender, they they don't have a gender, okay? However, in the Age of Rebellion, the prequel series, there actually is two um, Sleskis who do. Now, one is, um, I wrote this down on the back, okay? One is Skeklak, the collector, voiced by Aquafina, who is killed off, okay? Um, she, that's referred to as she, she's voiced by Aquafina, dies within the Age of uh, Rebellion. The other one is Skeklak, the ornamentalist, who was voiced in the film, okay? by Brian Mahal, and if I've pronounced that, M-U-E-H-L, I apologise in for this pronunciation, but in the prequel was voiced by Alice um, Dinian, who was also the puppeteer as well. So her voice was tended to be dubbed, they did a lot of stunt casting for the Age of uh, Rebellion, I don't particularly like stunt casting, but her performance was so good, it was kept. So it's interesting kind of dynamic between if they're gen if they're genderless. However, in the age of rebellion, she is I'm going to refer to her as a she because she is referred to as a she, as well. By f female pronouns. However, on the wiki she doesn't there isn't because they just speak in they pronouns. They um. So as they're kind of genderless, if you will, do they just assume a gender? Are they kind of on the non-binary spectrum, however they feel? like, Because one is a prequel series, after all. So at that point, did the ornamentalist kind of assume a female identity and then later on kind of transition into a masculine one? Something to think about as well. So, but hey, that, that is something to consider. When it comes to gender in this is very it's very kind of interesting dynamic as well for a species who have no gender how they assume the kind of gender roles if you will and though they are pretty much referred to by non-binary pronouns okay so let me get to Ogwa so Jen is on his quest okay Jen is on his quest and then he meets Ogwa now Ogwa is referred to as Mother Ogwa who is essentially she is the heart of Fro Okay, interesting what happens. Interesting what happens. She is essentially the heart of Fro. What essentially the Skeksis did because Mother Orga wanted to explore the stars, so the Skeksis built her her orrery. And then, on that note, then while she was kind of in a trance going throughout the stars and learning more about the heavens and the universe and galaxies, that was when they started their path of um, okay, genocide. Yeah, okay. And once again, this bit here, okay, right. Over here, okay. This is from Jen's point of view, right? Was she a woman? Jen wondered. Since the long ago days when he had lost his mother, he had never met any female of any species that could talk to him, and he was not exactly confident he knew the difference between the genders. Would some have been helpful in the matter where Jen had put questions to him? All he had answered was that the Uber had evolved as a species of neither gender, and therefore was therefore subject of which he had no concept. And since Jen had no, known whether he would ever meet a female, had not pressed the question. About Ogwa, there was something he could not not say, not could, that I could not name that struck him as what a female would mean. Right. And then Uwa, speaking of Ogwa, another, um, another, um, Uwa. The speaking of Ogwa has said, he watches the heavens and keeps her secrets. So his voice of her was harsh, hard and broken. A short of breath that... Was that the voice of a female had? What well, Jen reflected, a word there was a brisk voice, he did speak girlfling, however haughtily, but given some reassurance that on this mission of his, those he met might know his language. Okay. Obviously, in the um, original, um, I got actually voiced by a man, and when I figure, remember who he is, I will put his voice artist down there. <laughs> okay. So, so anyway, um, I think it's interesting as well, okay, because this passage of time, is that Ogre's got this kind of box that people who watch the film know this 
but also has got this box of crystal shards, okay? Now time has passed since the Great Conjunction that tore species in two, so she has actually no idea of this box of shards which she's just collected, which one is the right one. And it's interesting as well, okay, obviously the passage of time, how time has affected these people. You'd think that she being the spiritual leader, the spirit, the spirit of Thrall, she would know, okay? She is Thrall, but she doesn't. Because her time has moved on. It's interesting if she is the embodiment of Thrall, how in a way it's affected her. It's kind of like a form of losing her mind. As Thrall loses its soul as time goes on, she's losing herself. Which is actually quite a nice little parallel. Okay. So, um, right. And also, this book also, it kind of tries to explain more about the mythology of Thrall, which we don't get. This book is essentially an expansion of what we don't see in the film. And this bit here, okay, right, this bit here, this bit here, this is when trying to explain the Great Conjuncture from someone who was there, but kind of remembers it in fragments. She knows she has a part to play, but she wasn't really aware of her part until kind of later on. There you go, or so we think. Right, three circles all coming together, concentrate, huh, three some brothers before our daughters of moon. That story they tell you, you ask podlings, they need stories, then she drowns himself, they separate, and when the time comes together, they all got hammered at the triagonum on the table, make little rings on the surface of the white juice, big battle or big friendship, can't tell. Right. Trying to explain the Great Conjuncture in kind of symbolic form, instead of just explaining it, because that's just the way it is. Thor has... What has happened to her planet has affected her so much that all she kind of speaks now is the metaphors and riddles. But she knows she has a part, a part to play. There you go. And then, obviously, further on, um, the kind of the Ori is attacked. Um, Ogre is captured. Jen gets away, obviously. And then, further along, okay, in this world that he doesn't know at all, he meets, Ki he meets Kira. Okay? Yeah, yeah, Kira. Beautiful. Right. Again he heard laughter, this time behind his shoulders. He craned his neck around. From behind the tree a girl from girl stepped out. She looked at him with a broad smile and laughed again. Jen was aware of the ridiculousness of his position. Oh, he's hiding. So he's um he's in so he's like he's like a foggy patch. But he was much too stunned about the girl's appearance, trying to improve his dignity or to care that she was laughing at him or to feel anything except amazement. His open mouth made him more of a figure of fun. Right. So, that's when he meets Kira, who is the, well to me, she's the true protagonist of the Dark Crystal, but that's just me, okay? So she actually does make sacrifices. And once again, once again, also, the kind of gender issue comes in as well. It's been, now, obviously, this is from a Skessie's point of view, this is the Grantham Master. Now, the Grantham are the, essentially, kind of like, mindless soldier creatures... Um, bad kind of description who kind of go around Thrall and who once were <sighs> once were originally um, spiders of all things and they were kind of like morphed into the Grantham there you go right he was aptly carved in peel chair the Grantham master shot glance at the ritual master beside him what was he what was he up to the Grantham master wondered was this kind of some kind of saintly abstinence say abstentual sorry Abstentious, pros designed to impress the others with his holiness, and so it is established his right to usurp the throne at the first opportunity. Now, once again, words are very interesting in this book. Now, this is a book for young adults, okay. But the thing is, some of the words in it, like absolute, uh, sorry, abstinence, whatever, I spell the word because I can't pronounce it. A B S T E M I O U S. Abstemus, Abstemus, now found it, Abstemus, humor me, Abstemus. You will not find a word typically like that in a young adult novel, okay? Abstinence, maybe, but not that kind of word. It's a bit of a more kind of advanced word for a young adult novel. So, I mean, I've read, I've, I've read books like, like, when I was doing my master's, I've never contained a word like that. So, I did read, but... The Grandfather Master guided the opportunity and reckoned that if so, 
the, it would be if it was undertaken. A full screen and ruthlessness would have caused a sketchy perspective in a, in a ruler. Right, so the Grantham master stretched out his arm and grabbed a nearly empty cauldron from the treasurer. He stuck his head inside it to look at Clay and toss it away. See, once again, they're gendered. Right, that's interesting. That's interesting how, especially with one character who is presents as female in the original, say the prequel, now is use they use as male pronouns, but is using non binary pronouns on the wiki. There you go. Right. Mm -hmm. And this bit here, okay? Now, one thing is interesting. Now, in the kind of hierarchy, because the Gelfling society was a matriarchal society. Women ruled, okay? And in the prequel, it's called the Amara, which is beautiful. But this bit here, okay? Right. Right. This bit here is when Jen and Kira, they were weirdly podlings, but off they were attacked by the ground from the escape. They're kind of wandering around and they find a abandoned palace if you will okay okay while jen looked around to see what other wonders he might discover kira spellbound approached a chair and with reverence seated herself on it his back reached exactly up to the height of her head and her hand lay comfortably on the arms of the chair it might have been made for me she pronounced jen glanced at it and gave a respectful bow you look like a queen in it he said Kira nodded, smiling. She was not allowed to confess it to him, but the truth was that she felt like a queen. She closed her eyes. It was quite easy to imagine that those who dwelt here in the glory dare not to imagine them. She could almost hear them, their voices, their music, and feel their touch. The pollings, deeply superstitious about this place, believed it haunted by spirits, not told of who its former inhabitants, the old ones, had been. Now with shiver of intuition, she knew for herself. The girl flew. Right. The plaster walls Jen was gazing at were covered with frescoes, or rather one long fresco framed with a broad, elaborate, detailed border. Many creatures and events were pictured, but there was no doubt who the protagonists were. Girl flinging costumes of antique nobility formed the centrepiece of each tableau. Say, uh, tableau. Apart from the robes, the figures could have been those of Jen and Kira, for both of them it was like coming home at last. In awe they stared at what they must be their ancestors, the long and found story of themselves. A girlfriend queen in front, attended by an aged vizier and young courtiers bearing flowers and around them. Girlfriend farmers, carpenters, smiths, craftsmen, jewellery, dancers, servants with, with pokers and musicians, including a long-haired girlfriend girl, playing a forked flute that replicated Jen's belief. Each tableau was an emblem of trees or leaves. Right, so they found the history. But however, as the girlfriend and now they know themselves are made of society, well, Kira's now the queen. That's that's it, she's a queen. Right. And then you get the famous, the absolutely famous pose. Right. On single size a triple sun, what what once was sundered and undone, shall behold the two made one, by girlfriend hand, not else, by none. Written in runes is a prophecy. Is a prophecy. So at this time the Chamberlain, who is the uh, he is these Skeskis who tried to take control, kind of got kicked to the curb. He speaks go rip going, hmm, which is bad kind of interpretation, but that's, you know, that's not what they do. He is now after them. He knows, okay, this girlfriend is out there and obviously he wants them for himself. So, obviously, they take power, take control. There's a brief mention in the book of the idea of, instead of drain, capturing the girlfriend and draining of their power, they should have just captured them and bred them as slaves. And said they just hunted them to extinction. Yeah. Which is quite twisted for this book, by the way. Let's be here. Now, I'm going to read this, okay? Because this is the moment that terrified me as a child, okay? Right. The scientist monitoring the grandfather master had to stand well clear of the area, pulled down another lever. A rod swung out from the side of the vertical shaft. The end of it, a prism of crystal, was attached. The rod moved the prism into the beam of energy and held it there, reflecting a violent ray of light into the peasant's face. Immediately the peasant, a podling, stopped squirming and became rigid. From his fingertips, at the end of his extended arms, a crackling force field jumped to meet the crystal in front of the, in front of the chair. They were condensed into thick oily droplets which ran into the incline of the tube and dipped into the flask. The peasant's eyes were transformed from black buttons into murky staring orbs. 
The main bit like that when scientists reversed his levers, closed off the shaft again. The peasant's body twisted silently into the clamped chair. That's the moment that terrified me the most. That's the moment. Right. So. And also, what is going on? I think Jen, um, obviously, he's been alone all this time. He is kind of thinks he's on a hero journey by himself he says to kira you go you say i'll go you stay kind of thing i'll kind of sort this and she's like adamant no okay once again she she basically turns a decoy protagonist okay so it's more kira's journey and she's like no no i'm coming with you i'm staying with you now for the time the dark crystal come out actually this kind of thing is actually quite rare in films which makes it quite Kind of enlightening as well. Kira was saying, no, I don't need to be rescued. I'm going to do it myself. I know I could die, but I'm going to do it. It's my people too. And she actually starts to act like the Amara that she, or that she is. Right. Also at this time, and you start to wonder, okay, does Jen love Kira? Or it's kind of like a lack of options because they're the last two girls being left. There you go. Right. Mm-hmm. With the marvellous dispassionate clarity of the concentrated mind, see how the dialogue in this. He was fully conscious of what he valued. He hungered for the sight and the touch of Kira, at least the knowledge of what had been of her. Yet Kira and his care for her was as if another part of another life, an alternative life, past for sure, must be a future to come, infinitely more desirable than what he had to do now. But until he had accomplished his mission, he had no more choice than the spear in flight. All right. And then he kind of just pauses. says, he kind of gets into the castle. And uh, for those who haven't seen it, spoiler alert, okay, um, Kira is killed. But at the moment of the Great Conjuncture, um, Jen um, puts the crystal in, massive beam of light. Jen's actually not unconscious, so it's all the body has really kind of witnessed this. And the um, Ura and Iskeski is kind of joined back together. The ones, once Jen's on his little mission, um, they've been on this little, like, world tour, get into the castle to what a great conjunction has happened to kind of, kind of spin themselves on them and kind of rejoin into themselves and this actually kind of shows the moment that was actually wrong with the film okay now what happened was an accident okay between the Ura and the Skeskis or the Usek which is the actual species name but it still happened now they have spent over a millennia committing genocide they have reduced the dominant people they have made podlings, okay, slaves, okay, drained um, drain their minds, killed them, okay. They have reduced the girlflings to two, and that's it. And that's it. And this is their bit, okay, literally, right. This is three paragraphs from the end. The one that addressed them spoke again. We are the Ursex. Some are growing our folly and ignorance. We were almost destroyed this world we entered the great crystal intended to purge ourselves of our imperfections within so we shattered the crystal and ourselves into ura and skeskis but the world we sundered had been made whole by your courage your sacrifice you freed us from this world again returned into our next into the, to the next world we joined in our original form now we make you one again hold her to you she was part of you as we all passed each other you restored the true power of the crystal and make your world in its light Okay, and with that, um, Kira, who's been killed, um, comes back to life through the power. And with that, the um, Usek just literally just take off. They just go. And then you see kind of like a reveal of the world with the three sons, one splitting out, moving out of this conjuncture. It's not changed the fact that they committed genocide. And they're like, oh, sorry, sorry we killed all your people. We're now the last two left. Of your entire species, and now we're going to go now. Bye bye. That's my issue with actually the dark crystal. That's one thing that stops me from actually liking it all the way. It's kind of like, yeah, that's not good enough. Okay, you can't enslave your people, commit genocide, and say, oh yeah, we're sorry about that. We were foolish. It was a mistake. Sorry. Sorry, you killed your mum. Then. So, however, as a book, it is well written. Some of the language is it in it is really kind of advanced. For what you think about a typical young adult novel but i liked it i liked it. it was nice going back it was really nice going back and the illustrations are absolutely beautiful let me find my yeah, so 
And on that note, I'm signing off here. Talk your way too long. This is Six Books in Isolation. I'm buying.